Hello, Rock and Roll Rebels, and welcome to another episode of Ramble On with Rosie. We are here to discuss the clash. As aforementioned in a previous episode, this year is going to see a lot of 45th anniversaries for important punk events, not the least of which being the 45th anniversary of the release of The Clash's debut album, which is what we're going to talk about this week. The Clash's debut album, in fact, predates the Sex Pistols' only album um, by a few months, so while they formed after the Pistols, they beat them to getting a uh, album recorded, not terribly surprisingly. Um, this And this album was recorded over the space of about 12 days, you know, chopped up into about three or four weekends. And it's phenomenal for something that took less than a month, because it's the template for all things to come. I understand that some people, especially of the era, were like, oh, the clash changed, they went this, they stopped being just punk, they stopped... You know, they were never just punk. <laughs> Think about police and thieves, people. They literally did a rock cover of a reggae song, so <clears throat> they were never just a punk band. They were always so much more, which is why, to me, they are the punk band. Even as much as I love the Ramones, and the Ramones definitely invented punk, but that that is a ramble for another time, The Clash are, like, iconically punk, and this album specifically so, because it is their rawest, most punk album that they ever did. Just, it's like Bruce Springsteen said, you only get to record your first album once. You only get to be that fresh and raw and do whatever, you know, floats your boat without thinking about the effects of change or what you might do afterwards again. Like, you only have that freedom once. And The Clash absolutely made the most of it with their debut album. It's just... It is the punk album to me. Like, never mind the bollocks. And literally, never mind the bollocks. And um, never mind the Sex Pistols either, as, as good as they are. Even the Ramones, and that's a tough one for me. If I had to put hand somebody one album and be like, Hey, this is your introduction to punk. It's absolutely, unequivocally, not even another option going to be The Clash's debut album. Like, it's all the punk things wrapped into one. It is the punk album. Period. Fight me on this. I mean, I just threw my beloved Ramones under the bus for this, so I do not say this lightly. But literally, if I only had, could hand somebody one album and tell them, hey, this is what punk rock's all about, it's absolutely going to be The Clash by The Clash. So, let us get on to the content of said legendary album. It kicks off with a number titled Janie Jones, which you will see that featured on Paul Simon and the bass player's guitar strap from time to time. Um, I must have been a big fan of uh, London brothels. No, <laughs> the uh, titular lady is was an actual person who got involved in a scandal for potentially... Uh, was the, the, the conviction was controlling prostitutes. So basically she was kind of a madam and, uh, you know, went to jail for a few years about that in 1974. So just a few years prior to this album coming out. Um, in, but for me, I had always w misheard the woes in uh, Janie Jones, where he's in love with Janie Jones' world. Whoa, I heard his world. Which even gets the message across clearer, because the whole premise of the song is this dude in the mundane dead-end job daydreaming of, you know, the world of sex and scandal and glamour that sort of Janie Jones personifies. Um, especially with the recent scandal and all that, you know, apparently she had wild orgy parties and stuff and was showed up to a uh, film premiere in a topless dress. So just the sort of thing the businessman in the dead-end job is going to get through his... Uh, day thinking about. Um, later on, in 1982, The Clash, in fact, would um, do a musical project with the real-life Janie Jones. Uh, members of The Clash, as well as of the Blockheads, of Ian Drury and the Blockheads, recorded a single and a B-side with said burlesque singer, and Joe produced it. So they, they got to meet and uh, collaborate with the real-life lady topic of their song. They did a James Brown cover and uh, some original song. It, it's hard to find much information about it because, you know, she's more known for being a scandal queen than for uh, being a musical talent. 
However, um, later on in 2006, the English rock band Baby Shambles also did a cover of Janie Jones, and when they did the music video, they featured Jones and Jones, which would be Janie and Mick, who were in the music video, respectively, uh, being chauffeured around London uh, in a car. So, you know, very, uh, very interesting that everything comes full circle, and, you know, they... I mean, it's cool that she's also still around for that, you know, in 2006. I'm not, I think, yeah, she is still alive. Um, I did that in my research last night. Also, I found out that uh, legendary, and I do not say that lightly, uh, director Martin Scorsese is not only just a huge Clash fan, but he considers this song like the best British rock and roll song. He actually said that exact quote, greatest British rock and roll song. And he even used it in his film, Bringing Out the Dead. So it's really highly regarded song um, all around, and it is the perfect introduction to The Clash. You know, it's got their signature sort of rough harmonies, Joe's snarling vocals, and the closing with mix, you know, sort of softer vocal style counterpoised to Joe's, which, side note here, I will never stop defending Mick Jones's excellent singing voice like it's not traditionally perfect but as any of you who have been listening to me know traditionally perfect vocalists tend to bore me but Mick has such a lovely sweet and smooth in its own way kind of voice which makes it the perfect you know sort of sparring partner or whatever you want to call it to Joe's voice which is so rough and snarling and you know that they work great together, and in general, Mick Jones has a underappreciated vocal talent. Like, the man can sing, and it's really sweet. Like, you can understand why, you know, he had a penchant, at least prior to The Clash, for, like, you know, being a little bit more into love songs from time to time. And I'm like, because he's got a great voice for them! So, it's, you know, well done for Mick. Just a little spotlight there. I will probably end up doing an episode at some point just on songs that highlight Mick's singing talent, because he has one. He has a really good voice. So, moving on from that, because I, like I said, that's another episode for another time. And the next song on the album is Remote Control, which sort of expands on that vocal contrast between Joe and Mick that I was talking about, um, by doing it as more of a back and forth, rather than just Mick closing out after, uh, Joe snarls his way through Janie Jones. Um, and it, it's sort of a not quite a call and response, but it's, you know, definitely a back and forth interchange between their two voices, which, like I said, you know, contrast each other and therefore complement each other very well. There's some really good bass work done, which is pretty great considering as Paul's just learning how to play this instrument. Um, so it's, you know, that there, I mean, because you think about it, Mick Jones is over here not just doing all the other stuff, you know, helping with the arrangements and playing his guitar. He's also literally teaching Paul Subman how to tune his bass and play the thing. So, yet again, more love for Mick Jones for being a uh, talent. And, you know, as much as I love Joe, the clash was both of them. You know, you, you couldn't have one without the other. They tried. <laughs> it didn't work. Even Joe was like, that was a disaster. <laughs> You know, he's like, effectively, the clash ended when, you know, really when Topper got sacked, but definitely when Mick did. But moving on. So Remote Control, to me, has always been one of my favorite clash songs, especially the early clash songs. Um, even before I caught the Doctor Who reference at the end, which is a huge Whovian Doctor Who nerd, whatever you want to call me, I didn't even know that was there until I was listening to it and I was like, you know, I am a robot, I obey at the very close out of the song and I was like, that sounds familiar that sounds like a Doctor Who reference so I like go digging it I actually was googling it bass backwards where I was like, okay Doctor Who, I am a robot, I obey um, cause I thought the Cybermen said it, but instead it's the Daleks if you have any visual reference for Doctor Who, if you've never watched it, the Daleks look like salt and pepper shakers and or badminton shuttlecocks and run around yelling exterminate and basically want to kill everything that's not them. So kind of like space Nazis that are robots, for lack of better, you know, descriptions. Um, but the exact closing line is, gonna start on Tuesday, gonna be a Dalek, I am a robot, 
I obey, which I was just like, Joe and his savage roasting of society with a sci-fi reference is everything I need in my life. Though apparently it was Mick Jones was the big sci-fi fan, so I don't know, maybe if they were watching some Doctor Who. It's weird thinking about the show being that old that it's been around for like 10 years by the time this album comes out. You know, and so it's probably in the really popular Tom Baker seasons current at, at this point in 77. It'd be him or the dude after him. You know, because I think about it as the reboot that started in 2005. And so I'm just like, they're nerds. They're Hoovian nerds. This is this, this is life. This is this is all I needed to know. Like next time somebody makes fun of me for being a Doctor Who fan, I'll be like, the Clash were. What you gonna do about that? But um, moving on to the next song, which is "I'm So Bored with the USA," and as elaborated in the Joe Strummer, it wasn't that America as a place was what they were bored with. The target of the song was, like, the dark underbelly of American politics with Watergate and soldiers coming home as drug drug addicts and the influence of the dollar bill in international affairs and all those things. Like, it wasn't the people, the everyday man of America or, like, the scenery. You know, they certainly weren't bored with that. They were super excited to come and tour America and see all the places they'd heard about in the old songs. But the, uh... They were bored with the corruption of America, essentially. Which definitely illustrates that they were far more than just dumb punks. Like, most punks, let's be real, aren't that dumb. I mean, as controversial as Johnny Rotten can be, he's certainly no fool. Same way, you know, with The Clash. They, uh, (laughs) there's a lot of intelligence there. And even, you know, the Ramones. Had, had a lot of intelligence. Had a lot of other issues, too, but they were definitely no no dumb, no dumb dummies. And the Clash proves this, because they're aware of stuff that, you know, the average person isn't going to be thinking about, you know, isn't really aware that the fact that this push of American TV shows is pushing this sort of imperialistic agenda, you know, they're just going to be like, hey, I like this show. And don't get me wrong, I like Kojak. Kojak is a great TV show, but... You know, I can definitely see how, especially from an outside observer, they're like, oh dear, more more, more uh, American propaganda being shoved our way about how great they are while they do all these nefarious activities, or at least their government does. <laughs> so that um, really made it a good song. And also, it was, it's funny, because it initially was a, uh, not a love song, but a hate love song, as in like a Mad at You kind of love song with, by Nick Jones before Joe got hold of it and overhauled it, because it was, I'm so bored with you. And then Joe was like, no, we're not going to be talking about broken hearts or, you know, malaises in relationships. We're going to be roasting the military industrial complex in America today. <laughs> what would you like to do? So, <laughs> you know, Joe definitely added a lot of weight and punch to the, uh, the song than it otherwise would have been when Mick had it. In fact, <clears throat> we'll get to it later, but Mick only has one song from his pre-Clash career that made it onto this album unaltered, and why it had to be the song that it is, I don't know. <laughs> but we'll get to that. The next song is the song. Literally the the punk anthem to end and begin all punk anthems of White Riot. Like, if that's a big reason why if I had to hand somebody this uh, you know, an album and be like, this is punk, White Riot, if I had to hand, hand them a song, would be like, literally, this is punk, especially British punk, you know, it gets across the frustration, the sound, the melody, everything that is punk is like, especially early punk, is wrapped up in this song so well. Um, it was inspired by Bernie Rhodes, and I think it was Joe and Mick, possibly Paul too, witness the riots um, between the policemen and the West Indian population in Notting Hill in the area of London just like the summer before at their big carnival thing, which it's an ironic full circle that here they were at that carnival because it's an annual event in Notting Hill with the, you know, Jamaican and Caribbean population that lives in Britain around that area. Um, And so here the clash is sort of just starting to get together around carnival and then carnival hat you know the next when it happens in 82 or whenever it was 
right after Mick Jones is sacked, the next week is Carnival. And so he's there trying to grow a beard and not, not look conspicuous because he just lost his job and is getting roasted by, you know, his former bandmates for betraying the ideals of the Clash and whatnot. So, you know, it sort of bookends the career of the Clash. You know, it sort of began and ended with Carnival, which is, you know, the sort of sad sad, bittersweet, twist of fate, but, you know, as a side note, the Clash, with as generous as they were, could not have continued, you know, that they, they burned really bright for that really, you know, short space of time, about five years, three, even less than that, I think, especially if you just count it to when Topper left, and then, you know... <laughs> You can't expect people to be making three disc albums and selling them for a one disc price and, you know, keep their career going. They were so in debt. <laughs> so that's the side note there. As much as I would have loved for them to last forever, they, they're they one of those bands that just couldn't have. <laughs> was was going to end badly, and it did. Uh, but anyways, moving on from the... the uh, ending of the, of the clash and back into the thick of their uh, career um another reason why this is a super iconic punk number is cuz it throws back a small reference to the ramones the inventors and godfathers of punk because it begins with a rapid fire shouted 1 2 3 4 not at all familiar to anybody who's listened to the ramones and both the Pistols and the Clash were learning their instruments by playing along to Ramones records. So, you know, it's nice that they sort of put that in there while very much sort of the invent them and the Pistols being the inventors of British punk. They sort of, at least, at least the Clash are willing to admit that they were influenced by the Ramones versus... <clears throat> Johnny Rotten, who's like, oh no, we, we, we didn't have any influence of them, never mind the fact that Sid Vicious literally learned how to play his bass to listening to Dee Dee Ramone and his bass playing on the Ramones records. No. No influence at all. Whatsoever. Ugh. Anyways. Moving on from that. I have I have small beef for, for the attitude that the Pistols have and the damage they did to punk. As far as, you know, making everybody run screaming from it when it should have been the next prominent genre because it was a return to what 60s rock and roll had been all about. <laughs> Except for now it had more anger and punch. You know, the lyrics were less cheesy and, you know, vapid and were like in your face about real life issues. So it would have been really good. But, you know, this is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> Alright. So, and then the next song on The Clash is What's My Name, which is, the best part about this song is definitely the intro. I love that big, fat Gibson sound the Mick Jones gets in just that really, like, it's so out of the ordinary sounding. It doesn't sound like anything else on the album. It's just, bam, you get this hit of, like, you know, it's not quite bluesy. But it's definitely more towards blues than a lot of the other Clash, you know, guitar work is. And I'm just like, where did this come from? I love it. <laughs> you know, do a whole album of this, Mick. <laughs> Not that I don't love my punk, but I do love my blues rock, too. And whatever you want to define that sound that's at the intro of What's My Name, it's a, it's a really cool sound. I love it. And it definitely, definitely has a has a Gibson sound to it. You know, that big fat Gibson that Mick Jones plays it, it has a sound, and it's a beautiful sound, and I love that sound. Um, so yeah, that that that's pretty much um, it. You know, you have that intro, and then you get slammed in, t in the face by adolescent rage and misdemeanor activities with a really like hardcore chanting chorus. Now, after that, you get to the next song, which is Deny, and it lyrically could be blues, but musically is anything but. Like, you've got the theme of, you know, the mistrusted woman, but it's way, it's so much darker, and it's, you know, here he is, he's questioning everything from her plans to her drug problem, and, you know, accusing her of lying about all those. So it's a pretty dark 
song, but it also has a jab at the sort of faux dark songs. Because you know how we were talking about like the 60s with their kind of vapid lyrics? One of those being the splatter platter um, subgenre of 60s music. Things like Leader of the Pack and Oh Where Where Can My Baby Be? And so this song, uh, Deny, sort of takes a jab at those with the line of boy meets girl then probably gets ran over um, and the lines that follow that in this song, which is sort of, you know, acknowledging that while punk may have been founded as, you know, a return to the roots and musical ideals of the 60s where, like, accessibility, where anybody could play it, they certainly, especially British punk, was not about to, like, go back to the soporific tragedies of 60s pop lyrics you know where it's like oh she left me or oh my boyfriend died you know those uh, splatter platters are such a weird genre those those songs especially prominent in the 60s where you know like somebody dies i'm like why do i want to listen to this so uh the clash sort of take a a, a swipe at that you know silly subgenre of 60s music where it's like oh we're gonna sing about somebody dying tragically but in the most upbeat way possible like my mom went to a lot of dances and danced to a where where can my baby be which is about this guy's girlfriend dying in a car wreck try that for sort of anachronistic Uh, now back to the clash's favorite topic which is devastating you know natural events happening to the the nation's capital with London's burning (laughs) not to be confused with a few albums later when it's you know uh drowning is you know rising anyways the uh to me London's burning is like the British answer to now I want to sniff some glue by the Ramones because it's complete with the commentary on tv and other mind-numbing activities that you know people are turning to and, you know, it, it just feels like this is the British version of Now I Want to Sniff Some Glue by the Ramones. Has that vibe, rapid fire, punchy pace. Of course it is punk, same as the Ramones are. Um, and like I said, this theme is not uncommon to the Clash. They will return to destroying their capital city from time to time, both in the Clash and then later on, as in... Joe had a song that he did with the Mescaleros called London is Burning. It was also retitled when it made it onto the 2003 Mescaleros album, which is the posthumous album they released the year after Joe died, um, Street Core, and it was called Burning Streets on that album. But the version off the compilation, which is honestly, uh, the compilation is called 001, but that version on 001 is titled London is Burning not to be confused with London's Burning, and is my preferred version. It has a very 90s, early 2000s rock vibe to it. But yeah, so that's uh, their their favorite topic, destroying the capital city. Um, but yeah, so the next song, back to the struggling artists on the Clash album, is Career Opportunities. And they are just starting their careers and taking all opportunities to play that they can find. And... Before that, they were taking all the opportunities to work they could, too. You know, Mick was temporarily working for the uh, Department of Health and Social Security. Um, Joe had jobs scrubbing toilets in an opera house and digging graves. Um, Definitely not the calling that they were um, uh, destined for. They were destined to uh, go on and make London calling. But yeah, whose destiny is it to open letter bombs and... uh, be a slave in a civil service job anyways or you know fighting in the tropical heat in a foreign country and possibly dying which is basically the message of the song of you know humanity was meant for more than drudgery and the next song is an alternative lifestyle in answer to that which is cheat um alternative lifestyle of dubious morals to be fair um as a means to escaping the industrial soul killing as lined out in career opportunities. Um, it's one of the shortest but most thought provoking songs on the album. And yet, even though in spite of its brevity, it still finds time for Mick Jones to play a really cool groovy guitar solo and fade out. But I mean, I love Cheat. 
I can't say I necessarily completely espoused the, uh, or agree with the uh, ideology espoused in the song, but it definitely bears pondering. You know, you're like, I can't say I can agree with that, but I can definitely see its merits, as in, <laughs> the world sucks and something should be done about it, but not sure that's the answer, but it's worth not, you know, it's at least worth pondering in the head, if not, you know, I don't know that I'd ever attempt it. <laughs> But anyways, the uh, the next song, <laughs> here we go from deep ph philosophizing on the uh, state of Western civilization in a post-industrial society to the brands of condoms, <laughs> Protex Blue, which is the only Mick Jones song that made it from his pre-Clash days that made it unaltered onto this album. Why it was this one, I don't know. <laughs> like... You'd think this one would get the overhaul, but no. <coughs> Left intact to sing to his heart's content about, you know, a particular brand of uh, protection. Oh, boys. <laughs> now, we'll get back to the gritty real issues of life, of police and thieves. Being screwed over from one kind to another. Um, but <coughs> the only cover that is on the Clash's album, uh, the Clash's debut album, that is, and it was done by... Uh, Junior Mervyn, who's a, you know, Jamaican artist, and it was co-written, actually, by Lee Scratch Perry, who, it was Perry who produced the Complete Control single for The Clash, so one of their, you know, reggae influences, because, I mean, Mick and Paul had both grown up in an area of London, you know, around Brixton and stuff, and Notting Hill, where there was a lot of, you know, people from Jamaica and other Caribbean islands, you know, West Indian, as uh, they got called. Which makes no sense, you know, but then we forget that for a long time the Caribbean was referred to as the West Indies. Um, but yeah, so it has nothing to do with the country of India or, like, Native Americans. It's the, uh, population in the Caribbean and that general area. But yeah, so, um, and it also, to me, Police and Thieves is one of the biggest testaments, and I think Joe even said something about this, to Mick Jones's arranging skills, because they did this audacious thing and decided to do a rock cover of a reggae song, which nobody else was doing at the time, and they made it work. And a lot of that had to do with, you know, how Mick was choosing to sort of arrange it, because he's the most, especially at this time, the most musically knowledgeable of the four band members, and so, and he's sort of the quasi, you know, co-band leader with Joe. And he, you know, made this work. And it was, you know, it's the standout track. Like, this and White Riot are, like, the two songs that, you know, you pick to play to somebody off of the class, usually. They're just, you know, they're the ones that make it to the Greatest Hits album or something. Very iconic, very good songs, and Police and Thieves is definitely, you know, more complex and involved, and, and definitely longer. The thing's almost six minutes long, which is way longer than anything else on the album. But yeah, so, Police and Thieves is one of their best songs, period. And, you know, a precursor of things to come, because they will flirt with reggae time and time again in their music, and it's great because as other artists who are being influenced by The Clash cite, their, The Clash's music introduced them to these other styles of music like reggae and dub and ska and all those things that they would have otherwise had no idea about. I mean, whether it was because they got artists in these genres to open for them, or whether it's because they straight up used these, uh, the musical influence of these other artists in their own music, um, it definitely, you know, had an impact on the uh, up-and-coming artists that were younger than them listening to The Clash and being like, hey, well, let's go find more music that sounds like this, which is a really great, great effect. One of the greatest things an artist can do, I think, is to turn people on to the artists that influenced them. And The Clash, you know, definitely did that, and it was very, very well done, very good, very good thing overall to sort of get people out of the narrow world that they had been living in. Okay, moving on to the next song, which is 48 Hours. Looking forward to the weekend, as as we do. Now, I have the Tony Fletcher book, the, mu the 
the only music that matters. I think that's what I call it, the music that matters, which is on The Clash. And his attitude bugs me, especially about this song, because he straight up dismissed the band as being so out of touch with the work week, um, because, uh, you know, that they, they had addressed the weekend and, you know, the song being about the weekend. And they're like, oh, you know, they wouldn't understand what it's like to look forward to the weekend. Something I feel almost any human who's ever been to work or school understands. And he literally dismissed them as um, Dole Q veterans. And I'm like, Joe had at least four jobs I can think of. Nick had the one. Like, they've worked jobs just because they were on Dole for a while doesn't mean that's all they ever did with their lives. And this sneering attitude that so many music critics and writers have bugs me to no end. I'm like, can you discuss stuff without having to sort of get high on your own self-importance by putting other things down? Like, you didn't make this music, so stop having an attitude about it and just cover the good. And maybe if there's something that's bad, you know, point it out. But don't jump to these wild conclusions that are totally inaccurate. You know, don't take one portion of a person's life or career and make that the definition for all of their artistic output. So that bugs me. I had to address that here. If anybody has that book, um, be warned that that's not accurate. And also, I kind of want to throw this copy against the wall for being as sneering as that is. It's it's the same attitude of the enemy writer who said that, you know, the clash should be returned to the garage with the motor running. Like, it's not okay. Appreciate their output or don't appreciate it, but if you don't appreciate it, then don't just, you know, write things off like a snob. That's the part that bugs me. Um, but moving on to that, to the uh, song that was inspired by the line where the uh, enemy writer said that they needed to be locked in a garage, Garage Land, which is one of my favorite Clash songs. I absolutely love this song, period. Top ten, top five, possibly. And it was inspired by the Brutal Enemy review, where uh, the exact quote was, The Clash are, they are the type of garage band who should be speedily returned to the garage, preferably with a motor running. And I'm like, well, that's the same attitude that the writer on this book had. Uh, the the Tony, Tony Fletcher who wrote the one book on The Clash that I have, and I'm not sure if I want to keep it after that. But anyways, um... And according to Mick Jones, the, that particular review of being told that they needed to, you know, asphyxiate in a garage, essentially, uh, really sort of spurred them on and, and quote, to not only to write the song on behalf of all garage bands, but to make us strong. Joe did the lyrics and it deserved a good tune. And if you're asking me, both the lyrics, the tune and the harmonies in this song are great. I especially love the lyrics. Joe did a bang up job on the lyrics to this song one one of my favorites i mean i love the opening line with um back in the garage with my bullshit detector such a mood and i can't tell you how many times especially in lieu of recent events in the news that i've quoted the lines near the end of i don't want to hear about what the rich are doing uh specifically in reference to when everybody was losing their mind over the the, uh, Will Smith incident at the Oscars. And I was like, why do we care what these people are doing? So with that whole closing uh, verse, which is, I don't want to hear about what the rich are doing. I don't want to hear about where the rich are going. They think they're so clever. They think they're so right. But the truth is only known by gutter snipes. Literally, Joe just scathed. Talk about scathing reviews. He just scathed almost any given article in the, the world of, uh, you know, pop entertainment. He, he basically just set the checkout stand at the uh, grocery store lines on fire with that one. It's, it's roasted to a crisp. There's nothing left if you take out all the stuff that's just talking about rich people being stuck on themselves. Those magazines disappear awful quick. <laughs> you might be down to a coupon for Tide detergent. If you got rid of everything in the magazine that wasn't about, you know, fawning over the rich, which is essentially what, you know, Joe is against. And he puts it very well in this song. So I'm just like, I love this song so much. It is such a mood. It's so spot on and an inspiration. And like I said, I end up quoting the I don't want to know about what the rich are doing 
line a lot because it's still relevant, unfortunately. That is the, both the good and bad thing about The Clash is that they're still relevant. Whether it's I Am So Bored with USA being relevant about, you know, foreign relations or, um, you know, Garage Land being relevant about people being obsessed with, you know, celebrities you know, so many of their songs still still hold weight, which is why they are kind of the only band that matters when it comes to living life outside of, you know, your internal world and, like, your relationships. If you're look, looking at the world at large, nobody writes like The Clash does. So, enjoy this album, which is now 45 years old. Go rock out to it. Um, side note, if you're wondering why, if you're an American and you're wondering, well, it's not 45 years old for me. My copy says 1979. That's because this album was not released in America. It was re-released with a couple different songs on it and stuff in 1979 after the second album had already been released um, over here. But the first one just was an import and it sold massively, like over 100,000 copies, which was kind of unheard of for an import at that time that wasn't really being advertised over here. So that's your fun story. If there's some discrepancies and you're like, well, I was alive back then and my copy didn't have these songs on it. <laughs> if you had an American copy, that'd be why different songs were on it. Some of them were the same and some of them were different mixes, but they were not the exact same, and the American version didn't come out till 1979. So if you have one of those copies, then it's only 43 years old. Either that or I'm bad at math, but yes. So happy 45th anniversary to The Clash. Listen to it, rock out, you know, enjoy White Riot as it was meant to be enjoyed with at the highest volume your ears can handle while screaming along to it. And scream along to uh, all good rock and roll and I will be back with more fun facts on rock and roll in future and until then um, be kind to each other and rock on